Once as you play. I'm not quite ready. Okay. Roll one. Okay. Okay, and then I'm gonna wait till you finish scratching. Okay, so tell me how strict the mill village was and counter that image of the parties. Spot now. Yeah. Mr. D.M. Wood was superintendent. And if he had to lay off one of a family, he laid them all off. When we lived there in 1913, Mr. Bearden's family had the measles, and so did the Ingrams, and so did the Zimmermans. And they were out, they were had the measles and they were at home. But sometime after they were getting those the measles, Mr. Bearden got drunk. Mr. Woods heard about it. So he gave them notice to move and they didn't. Papa was over at Nick's store and Mr. Woods tell him that they was going to put the Beardens out. Papa said, well, you might get yourself into it if you do. <laughs> Put people out and you never. Papa carried him by the house and showed him the law on it. Papa had a law book. He showed him the law on it. So in about three weeks, one of the beard, one of the woods girls married the beard and boy. <laughs> That's about the cutest story I know because he's been going to get rid of the whole family. But Mally Woods married Clarence Bearden about three weeks after they were going to put him out. Now compare Noonan and Hogan'sville. East Noonan and Hogan'sville. East Noonan. Well, I was homesick. Just okay. saying. Can you right, tell absolutely. us after we move? They had all the difference in the world. Okay, okay, okay. You got to tell us. Well, we don't know that you moved yet. So tell us why why you moved or when you moved. Uh -huh. And then describe how you got homesick. I didn't want to tell that, but that, I was because I was moving. Uh, just say, okay, we moved from, yeah. we lived in Noonan for so long. Nine we, years. Okay, start. We lived in Noonan for nine years, and I was the cause of us having to move to Hogan'sville. Okay? Go. We lived in Union nine years and moved down here in 1924. Okay, we're going to start again, please. Moved to Hogan. Okay, that's beautiful the way you said it, but when you touch the table, I hear it. So try not, don't touch okay. the table and start again, okay? We lived in East Union for nine years. That was the longest we lived anywhere for a long time. We moved to Hogan for night, October 24th, 19. 34. I mean, 24. Let's start again. Okay, let's start again. You moved in 24, right? Okay, let's start from the top, okay? We lived at East Union for nine years, long as we lived anywhere for a long time. But we moved to Hoganville in 1924, and there's all the difference in the world in the two working. I went were me and Leona both was working in the spinning room. So it was me and Leona and Lovella. But I didn't make friends too good in Hogan. They were not friendly. And I got homesick. So I'd go back to East New York on weekends for a pretty good while. We knew some people down here. Cranston's and the Rogers, several families, but they just won as friendly down here. East Newman, if we didn't know who'd come to work, we'd go ask them the names. Now, you were just telling me that you were the cause of having to move to Hogan'sville. Yeah. So, start with, I was the cause of us having to move to Hogan'sville, if you would, and tell me why. Well, I was because I was having to move. When Claude Bach, when this mill, the old mill in Hogan, was on short time, 
there was a good many families moved to East Newton. But Claude Boggs got an overseer's job, and that was spinning and spooling. And every time he could get anything on a kid, he'd go bless them out about it. And I was a kid when he first went to work there. But when Leona went to work, I was determined that he wasn't going to treat Leona like he did me. So I went over there. I don't remember what I went to Leona's job for, but she was crying. I said, what's the matter? She said Claude Boggs accused her and two other little girls uh, trying to get up a union. And she didn't even know what a union was except what Papa had read in the paper about the coal miners and the railroad. So I went to look for him. I went all the way across one spinning room, couldn't find him, started across the other spinning room, and I saw him crossing out there at the spool room. And I went out there and told him. I mean, <laughs> I told him he better not. I said, I, Leon don't even know what getting up a strike is. I told him he better not go down there fussing on Leon no more. And Eugene, my brother's working in the twister room. So he saw us out there and he come on out there. About that, before we got very far in the argument, Mr. Woods walked up and he said, Claude, what's this all about? He said, well, I went and had a talk with Leone, and Eddie Mays come and took the big end of it. Mr. Wood told me to go to my job. I said, I will, when he owns up that he told a lie. Eugene just took me by the arm and pushed me towards my job. And it was after I left that he told Claude if there's any more of it, we just lay the whole family on. We went home at 12 o'clock and told part of it. But Eugene always, I mean, Eugene went to the barbershop. No, it was that night. It was 12 o'clock the next day. Eugene told Pop what Mr. Wood said. And he said, you, all of you go to the mill and just tell them you leave him. But when I got up there, he was writing, writing out my time. When he brought it to me, he just ran <laughs> it like this. I said, thank you a lot, but if you'll go down to the house and see Papa, he'll thank you more than I do. But Papa went to see both of them. Mr. Wood said, well, we could just go back to work, but we didn't want to go back to work. So Mr. Harris told him a week or more after that, said, well, you lost a good family of employees. He said, hmm, they'll be back asking for their job back in six months. But I never did want to go back. Nothing except I liked the people. I went back up there for I went to church up there about three times, but I went back up there for parties at least a year after I left. Well, when they fired you like that, did you have trouble getting a job in Hovensville? Tell uh, Judy about that. No. Okay, to start with... Tom Hughes was working can you here. Can you start? We didn't have trouble getting a job mm -hmm. in Hovensville. Start with that, please. Well, I don't know whether Pop, I don't think Papa even come to Hogan. Tom Hughes was my brother-in-law. We need to stop. Okay. Oh, yeah. I hear you, Robert. George, you don't want me to have to tell the story in my, do you? What? You don't want me to have to tell that beautiful story with, a, uh, with another angle, Let's do go. you? Okay. Okay. If I talk too much, tell me. Okay. Okay, that was an incredible story. Mm -hmm. It really, really was. Okay, George, do you tell me how, when, 
what Homer Welsh did here in terms of being a mill worker and then how he came to join the union and become a leader and try and make it as compact as possible. Well, now, I listened when Leona was talking. She said he was organizing here. Them two men organized. Okay, okay. And I'm now, gonna, now, you tell the story the way you want to tell the story, elected okay? Elected officers. Okay, start from the top. I want to know how Homer, what Homer did here in the mill and how he became an active union person, okay? And you describe it any way you well, need Well, he was... Start with Homer Welsh. Homer. Homer Welch from the dope wagon, what we call the dope wagon. They had Coca Colas, different drinks and sandwiches, cookies and candy. He come through twice a day. But when he joined the union, and we met up there for the first time, they elected officers, and Homer was elected to be president of our group. Now, Homer might have got a few to join after, after the officers was elected, but as far as I know, he's just our president. But after Hogan, well, he did organize places, at least if I'm not bad mistaken, he went I don't say he organized that group in LaGrange, but he went down there and helped them out. I know that. And I don't know whether he organized in Alabama or not, but that's the place he almost got killed. Okay. Let's go after the strike, what Homer... I know that Homer went to LaGrange after the strike, and he was mm -hmm. working to help out those folks. Um, so could you describe what you understand was to be going on in LaGrange and Homer well, leaving first, here? And also tell us that Homer's family stayed with you. Well, first of all, they made a case against him about being in Unum. I don't know where Homer was when we got home. But they said he had a gun, had a pistol in his pocket when he got out up there. But he didn't. We had to go to court about Homer having a gun. And I don't know just how long it was after that strike that they began putting them out in the green. But now Homer did, I think he did help to organize part of them people. I mean, I think he took an organizer's place but he he went down there every day, and Opaldine and, and Lee Olin stayed with us. That's the reason the neighbors told that we was having union meetings a long time after the strike. Grandpa and Grandma Johnson thought we was having union meetings, and so did the McCurries. But now we live next door to Mr. and Ms. Baker, and they, were, they didn't join the union, but they were always good friends of ours. Okay. Thank you. All I can say is he's just a good leader. But he, he is always present at the meetings. And they did have to, they did have to get another, somebody in the uh, if I'm not mistaken, Harry Barton was, I don't know what, what Harry was, but he he had some kind of office and so did Ed Lester. They had to get somebody in their places. I think Charlie Frank Green took one of them's place. I don't know who took the other. But we didn't have lots of meetings after we come back after Eugene Talmadge called. Okay. So Let's still in it. Tell us what Harry Barton did in the union, How what his job was. Okay? As far as I know, he was elected no. an officer. Yeah. Harry Barton. Yeah, I know. I know. Maybe. Start, can you start with Harry Barton and then tell us what he did and then what I, he went on to do in the union? Okay, start from the top. I know what happened to that. 
And what happened to him? Afterwards? I really don't know. Okay. Okay. What he did. He was an officer, though, right? Yeah. Okay. So could you? See but it? he went down to the picket line. Okay. Start from the top. Start. Never Harry. say he. Say always Harry. Barton. Barton. Start again. Was elected. Please, I cut you off at a minute. Can you start with Harry Barton? I said Harry Barton. Okay. I'm sorry. Was Harry. elected as some kind of an officer, but during the strike. He went down to the picket line to break it up. We were told he had a gun. I don't know whether he did or not. But he got an office job. If I ever still read that, he'd call me up and bless me out to, I guess. Um, after the strike, talking about how the community reacted, and you were telling me... Well, I just... Start with after the strike. Well, after the strike was when Mr. McCurr and Mr. Johnson watched our house because Homer Welch was gone. Leoli was at our house. I don't mean she stayed there all the time, but she stayed there at night most of the time, and both of them thought we was having union meetings at our house, and this is a long time after the strike. But we did pay union dues until they put the people out on the range, and when they did, we quit. This is very important, so I want to start with, after the strike, the union stayed together. Can you tell me how your union stayed together? I know it was just 12 members paying dues, but, but tell me that in one full story. And then explain to me why you decided not to pay anymore, because I didn't get, I don't quite understand it. They put the people out in the green. I don't know why the others, I don't know just exactly who the 12 members were, but there's three of us, me and Oval and Leon. Okay. Adam, you can't touch a microphone like that. Pay a dues. Okay, now what I'm going to ask you to do is to say, okay, when I'll we, tell you when. Okay, start now. When we first got back to Fort McPherson, I think there's a good many of them still together. But when this conflict happened in the grains, there wasn't but 12 of us paying our union dues. And I told Papa, if they put them people out in the grains, I'm not going to pay any more union dues. So they did put them out. And that's when me and Lil Baller and Leon all quit paying union dues. And Papa took them. See, there's four of us. And now, ask her, and after that, how much longer did you work okay. in the mill? Okay. And I worked till I was... Okay, after you came back from Fort McPherson, tell me, I know that you went back into Stark Mills. Explain to me that you went back into your job and how long you stayed, and if there was ever any conflict because you were still believing mm -hmm. in the Union. Okay, start with when I came back from Fort McPherson. Well, when we came back, we just worked on here. I worked till I was 60, three years old. Lovella, Lovella come out when she was 65. Leona married Boots Pond. And when Charles, her oldest boy, was born, she, she quit work. Or she couldn't keep nobody to get her, keep her baby. Lovell worked till she was 65, and I worked till I was 63. I come out when I was 63. Now, we have heard from a great many people that you were... I always said I was first, I, uh, I was last and to leave the mill, but I never would leave my job behind. And I always tried to be okay. the first. Um, okay. Okay. okay, start with, I was the last one to leave the mill. Different ones teased me about being the last one to leave the mill. That 
after they put a fence around the mill, they locked it after we all come out. See, there's running the night line. They called it a night line, day line too. And we were in a six room house when we left here, but we had to go in a fire because they started the night line and they worked people night the same in, as day. But they, a lot of them teased me even after they quit working at night. Said I was always slow getting up there and I was slow going home. <laughs> I never would leave my job behind. Tell me about how hard a worker you were in the mill. I know you're modest, but... Well, see, they changed frames three times. When we first come here, I worked downstairs with some frame, on some frames, I never, I didn't know there's such frames in the world because I had a big steel roller at the back. The only one upstairs, now the, the frames upstairs are about like, well, they're a little bit bigger than they were at East Newton, but there's something on the same order. Well, when the mill went short for 18 months, they didn't start up that spinning room downstairs. And the rollers rusted, but they finally moved it upstairs. And then after that, uh, they had real tall frames. You had to stand on tiptoe put the roving up like this. And before I quit the mill, they had some magnetic frames. And they were still harder to reach and harder to work on than the ones we was working on. But I went, I never have been back down there but one time. And you, you wouldn't even know that you was in the same place I worked in all that time. They, got, they have clean floors. They don't have a bobbin, a wood bobbin in the whole place. All the bobbins are pretty colored plastic. Even the spinning roving bob, bobbin are kind of like jack-o'-lanterns. You wouldn't know. I wouldn't know I ever worked in it because it's rayon and it's clean and it's pretty. Oh, that's uh, good. Okay, well, don't worry about how long it lasts. But it kind of wore off. Okay, start with the friction and describe it to me. Well, you can just tell that they didn't want to have anything much to do with you. Okay. And uh, when my sister Velma married, she was on the steering board. But the Can you start again? Can you I don't really I need for you to say strike I'll was tell you when over. Okay, now. When the strike was over, the neighbors and friends that you'd had before, you could tell that there's friction between us because they didn't want to have too much to do with us. And uh, when my sister, Bella, was on the steering board, the preacher that left here, and another one coming, he went around and asked overseers and supervisors and people that made more money than we did to go to town. He really wanted them to move from St. James, from our church, and go to town. And that, that's the reason I couldn't have as much respect for Harvey Holland as I always had. Because up until the strike, he visited us, and he sent Bamber to Camp Bowler, 
you know, to a youth group camp. Well, the church sent him, but he, he selected him. And the same way with the neighbors. But it just finally wore off. We, we were real close to the family next to us, but they just quit. <laughs> They'd turn their heads if we went past them. As Ruby and Maddie McCurry and Ms. McCurry was in bad health, and they had brought her up home a few times when she'd be sick especially when the house caught fire. We brought her up there and put her to bed, and she stayed up there that night. But they reported everything that went on up there. You mean in your house? They reported to the mill office. Okay, start that again. They reported everything that went on in my house to the mill as far office. As start again. Everything that they know of that was going on at our house, they reported it. I don't know whether it was him or one of the girls. Yeah, sorry, we have to do that. They reported it to the mill. Yeah. Start again and explain that they reported it to the mill and how that made... Well, I just know... I said after the strike, the family that lived next to us that had been good neighbors reported everything they know to, know to report to the mill, at the mill office, the big office, not to where we worked. They sent for me to come down there one day and I didn't know what it's all about. I got down there and they said, well, it was reported to us that there's a man stealing your coal last night. I said, well, I didn't see it, but my niece did. But I said, I didn't see it. <laughs> man lived up on the corner. Come down and got him two coal skulls full of coal. But now that, that happened at East New a lot of times, too. Okay, okay. you finished? Okay. Now, why... Well, you may not know it, but we got better wages because it's organized at Winsburg. See, oh. they had a U.S. rubber at Winsburg, North Carolina. And several years after the strike, W.L. Martin was our overseer. He sent Jason, they was going to vote on it at the mill, whether to try to organize a union or not, W.L. sent J.C. Thomas down there to talk to me, and J.C. didn't say much. He just said, well, there's no need in talking to you. He went back and told W.L., well, no need in him talking to me about the striker Eugene Talmadge either. So W.L. comes down, and I told him, I said, now, Mr. Martin, you know that I know that you live North Carolina on account of a strike, and I know you don't like them, but you will have to admit that the reason we got get the little raises that we get, they're organized in North Carolina. They the same company. All that was U.S. rubber. They had a mill in Winsboro, North Carolina, and another place, North Carolina. But now, you, there was U.S. rubber mills in a lot of different places, and some of them were organized, too. 